Very welcome this evening to our Young Professionals Network webinar, a uh, discussion on the future of Scotland post-Brexit. My name is Darren Moriarty. I work in communications and research at the Institute and I also chair our YPN. Uh, when we originally booked this webinar in a couple of weeks ago, I don't think we knew we'd be in the middle of a heat wave, uh, but that's what you get, I think, when you book something in for late July. So um, you're very welcome this evening if you're watching us from outdoors with a bit of sun. Um, and you're also very welcome if you're sitting in doing nothing. Um, this is the second YPM we're having in very quick succession. We usually space them out a bit longer, but last week we had a really interesting discussion on global access to COVID-19 vaccines. And we're delighted to follow that up this evening with uh, Mary Black, who's an MP with the Scottish National Party. Um, Mary's going to share her thoughts on Scotland's future. Um, now that Brexit has, of course, become a reality. And this discussion that we're having this evening also follows the recent Scottish Parliament elections, which took place in the spring, where the SNP were returned for a fourth consecutive term in government in Scotland. And um, before I formally uh, introduce Mary, let me just briefly run through the format for this evening. Mary's going to talk uh, for, for a very brief opening remarks. She's going to give an initial five minutes or so, and then we get straight into discussion. So um, I'll kick off maybe one or two questions, but we are very keen to hear from all of you watching in, and obviously, you know, the topic at hand is Scotland and Brexit and the future of the UK as a whole. But if you have any other questions at all for Mary, Mary said she's happy enough to expand that and take any questions that you're interested in. Um, you can submit all of your questions in writing via the Q&A function on Zoom. And also then, if you want to follow the discussion on Twitter, you can do that using the handle at IIEA and hashtag YPN. Um, before I hand over the floor to Mary, just let me briefly introduce her. Mary has been an MP with the Scottish National Party since the 2015 general election. Uh, following her very active campaigning the 2014 Scottish independence referendum, she was approached by a local branch to stand for election, and at the age of 20, she became the youngest MP since the Reform Act of 1823. Um, she's been elected two times since then, 2017 and 2019, and she's campaigned a number of different issues, including social justice, um, an end to austerity, Scottish independence, among other things. Uh, Mary, thank you very much for being with us this evening from uh, Baking, Scotland, and uh, you're very welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you, Dara. Cheers. And if my grey hairs are anything to go by, I have aged three decades uh, in the last few years. Um, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me along to this. Uh, much appreciated. And really, I I'll probably keep my comments quite brief because... I think it's better to answer questions, especially if you're a politician, frankly. Um, so just to give you a snapshot of where Scotland is at the moment and where Scotland has changed since 2014, which is really when my involvement in politics was formally started, so to speak. Um, how we've changed since then, uh, in a nutshell, essentially all the things that we warned would happen in the 2014 campaign have now happened. Uh, essentially, Scotland being taken out of the EU against its will, somebody like Boris Johnson becoming Prime Minister, folk like Nigel Farage dictating what the uh, narrative of society is, essentially. Um, so it has been quite a scary place, I, I think, uh, over the last seven or eight years. And that in itself, I mean, I know I'm biased already supporting independence, but that in itself, I think, has driven enough people to certainly question the UK as a whole. And it's one of the things that I actually said in the previous referendum campaign, which still holds true, which is if you were to imagine that Scotland was already an independent country and you were being asked, do you want to join this union, this United Kingdom, what would the selling points be? because quite frankly, there are none. Um, and that has become abundantly clear over the last, certainly since I've been elected in politics, um, because not only has the things that we warned against happened, but I think that pol UK politics as a whole has declined in quality over the, the last decade or so. And in particular, uh, the one, the most recent example that comes to mind is Dominic Cummins, for instance. We have someone who has essentially brought in an age of politics where facts don't matter or facts don't have to matter. And 
yet here he is on UK news media going, look, I, I have the facts as to why this government is terrible, and lo and behold, nobody seems to care. And that is frankly scary um, for your political system to be, I suppose for the bar to be so low as to what is acceptable behaviour and conduct. Um, so there's a, 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 an ocean of issues, uh, quite frankly, that the UK has had over the last a couple of years that I could talk about, and I'm sure we will talk about tonight. But in amongst all that, you have Scotland, which continually has shown time and time again that it wants to go in a different direction. And the fact that the SNP have won, uh, you know, so many consecutive elections is actually a testament to not just the political party and the Scottish government, but it's also a testament to the direction that Scotland is travelling in and where we've seen, I would argue, a, a rise in the far right, particularly in the UK. In Scotland, it's not been able to grip quite as deeply as it has in other parts of the UK. And the only way that I see Scotland actually freeing itself from this system entirely is and always has been independence. Um, we have a range of resources which have been frankly wasted by Westminster, have been neglected by Westminster and mismanaged. And we cannot afford to allow that to happen to another generation because we are still living with the issues that the previous generation created uh, and the effects are long, long lasting. So we just cannot afford to, to give that up, frankly. Where it's incumbent upon folk like myself, particularly SNP or pro-independence politicians, is we need to try and convince people that we can do this. And part of the difficulty in that, in that is unpicking this narrative that has been woven for years that Scotland is not good enough, that Scotland is a detriment uh, to the rest of the UK. It's We're a charity case, you know, we we take resources from the UK much more than we produce. And it's quite frankly, just is not true. No matter which angle you look at it from, Scotland is a massive resource, natural, trade-wise, uh, even population-wise, we have a very skilled workforce. So for me, all the ingredients are there. It's just about the people now giving us the go ahead to do it and us giving them the confidence to feel that they can do it. Um, so I'll stop rambling on there and hope, hopefully there's, that'll have spurred at least some questions. Um, so yeah, thank you again for having me, Dara, back to you. Brilliant, look, thanks very much for that initial overview, Mary. Um, and again, just as questions, why is, you know, obviously Mary has, has, has focused our initial comments there on Scotland and, and the, Scotland's future beyond uh, possibly independence with Brexit now being reality, but she did say at the, at the outset she was happy enough to take any other questions. Just for anybody that joined late, if you want to throw in any other sorts of questions to Mary, she's happy to, to expand the conversation. But just picking up on one of the points you made there, um, Mary, about sort of this 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 sense that, you know, I mean, you use the word charity case. Um, I mean, how, obviously with hindsight now, looking back at the 2014 election, um, you know, the stability of the UK back then, was supposedly something that was what does what does that look like now in 2021 post Brexit with Boris Johnson at the helm? It's in tatters, I think, um, in every sense because even the UK government right now don't have a clue where Brexit's going to end up they are making it up as they go and it's whatever they can do to save as much face as possible and spin whatever narrative they want um, which is of course very unstable <laughs> uh, even in terms of how we work I mean it's plenty of it's on the record but I was far from impressed with Westminster when I arrived in 2015 in terms of how it works but over the last year in particular two years the we have much less notice of legislation that's coming forward. Legislation changes at the last minute. Uh, we don't know things until literally maybe two days before, the day before. And it's deliberate tactics to create chaos. 
Um, and when your government is founded on managed chaos, you know, that's just a recipe for disaster. And in actual fact, Scotland, I, I think, has been a credit to us itself in being able to weather these storms eh, as well as it has done. And particularly, again, I know I'm biased, but Nicola Sturgeon as a leader throughout the pandemic in comparison to Boris Johnson, there was no competition eh, whatsoever. Eh, one was states state-like, one was informed and articulate, the other was nowhere to be seen, essentially. Um, so, yeah, I, I do, I think that even the most staunch unionist would have to admit that the UK is not stable just now. Um, and it's, I, I think believing in the UK just now involves sort of hooking your hope onto something that I, I don't think is going anywhere. Okay, and then just just other questions. There's a good few questions coming in, so obviously you've you've got the audience going. Uh, but one more for myself before before I, I get there. Mm -hmm. um, just in terms of the lessons from the Brexit referendum itself, um, you know, obviously you've been to 2014 referendum. We've seen 2016, where sort of the consequences and implications of things were not thought through. You know, I mean, yeah. particularly from our point of view, and we're over here. And, in Ireland, and we were screaming about the board, and the board just didn't didn't feature at all. And um, you know, are there lessons that can be learned from how the referendum was carried out, and, and more importantly, sort of where you land after the referendum? It's all very well talking about the future, but where do you actually land, and what are the implications going to be? Is there anything you can take from the failings of the Brexit referendum and apply to a potential future second Scottish referendum? Well, absolutely, uh, I think so. Uh, the the one thing that I've that I have thought the the brexit process has been very useful for is having something to point at and go this is what happens when you do it wrong <laughs> you know because uh, quite often the first thing that people say to me is right but why do you support being in that union the eu but not the uk that doesn't make any sense and as a sentence alone yeah you're right that's a, a conflict but they're two completely different unions and one of them is for all its faults is very modern very forward thinking and actually democratic and, you know and we've seen that play out throughout the brexit process with ireland you know it, all it took was ireland to say i'm not happy or any one of the uh, member states to say no i'm not happy and that was it nothing went further until that had been resolved compare that to the uk where Scotland for the last 70 years now has had a government that it did not vote for, that it actively rejects in every general election time and time again. Scotland does not vote Conservative and yet we have had to spend all of the evolution as I've known it having to protect ourselves from these policies that we never voted for in the first place. So in that sense, I think that Brexit also was useful for showing that you have to have a clear plan of what you're doing and you have to you have to bring people with you. There's no point in doing something just for the sake of it. And for me, Brexit was also, as a campaign, was lacking in substance um, because there are reasons and arguments for not being in the EU or for seeking out a, a sort of Norway status or, you know, something similar. But none of those arguments were the ones at the forefront. It was either absolute lies or it was xenophobic or it was outright racist, just dog whistles all throughout it. And when you've, when you've got a, a campaign and a, a constitutional movement, so to speak, that is built on that, I don't want to know where that ends up because I think history tells us where it ends up. Um, and that is just the exact opposite of what Scottish independence is about. I, I think for the vast majority of people who believe in independence that it epitomises everything that we don't want and everything that we want to get away from. Um, and it, just while I'm, I'm babbling, <laughs> while it's in my head, the other fundamental problem at the heart of Brexit and I think the fundamental problem at the heart of the UK as a whole is that 
nobody's got a clue what being British means, and yet it's at the heart of everything that this government does. You know, as far as I'm concerned, from a Scottish perspective, British is synonymous with English. It, it doesn't, they use it interchangeably, the rest of the world uses it interchangeably. So does that tell us something? And in that case, what is British culture? Is it just invading other countries? Because if it is, cool, but we need to deal with that. We need to talk about it. And there is just no room for that conversation to even happen in the UK just now, which in itself, I think, is a deeply telling and unhealthy thing, which is another reason why I think we want to get away. Just on that, I think you've touched on a little bit of this, Mary, but a, a question's come in from Owen O'Keefe, and he just talks about sort of having an inclusive referendum mm -hmm. and, you know, sort of the way the two sides leave and remain were sort of at each other's throats, and even afterwards, the sort of gloating that went on. Yeah. You know, what can be done to have a more inclusive referendum which brings the so-called losers along with you? You know, there's not some sort of a zero-sum game. It's not 50 plus one, and that's it. Um, but, you know, you sort of have a conversation where you're bringing people along, and I suppose that's something that we're talking about on this island as well. Yeah. Uh, so very interested to hear to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, sure. Um, well, there's a couple of different things. Uh, firstly, I would say that, of course, you, there's broader options like, you know, citizens' assemblies and committees afterwards that you set up, you know, to, to make sure the, post, the process is as amicable as possible. But I would take, the, go a step uh, previous to that and say that what's key for me is that we democratically have to achieve independence. I think that, you know, there's sometimes talk uh, from independence supporters that we want UDI, that we want it just to declare independence. And have I frozen? Am I back? All oh, right, I'm okay. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't sure if it was you or me. Uh, there's only two of us. I wasn't sure if it was my connection. My, your connection. my Wi Fi has been fighting me for the last three days. So apologies if it is me. Um, Sorry, I, what was I saying? Uh, what was I saying again? I've totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> I'm actually not sure. I think my my internet was gone for a little bit there. Um, but the, so yeah, two of us are having Wi-Fi problems because yeah. we're on the blink. Um, the question? question yeah, I'll go back to the question. The question yeah. specifically was um, around having an inclusive discussion on 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 the referendums so that the the the, the so-called losing side doesn't feel, yeah. you know, that they're completely lost out and 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 the, the world is over. You Thank mentioned you. constitutional conventions, committees, etc. Afterwards. Perfect. So th that's kind of one angle that you could go at it from. But I think that the, the the imminent thing that we have to do is address disinformation. Um, and there's, I suppose, there's an element of building the plane as we're flying it in that sense, because disinformation is such a prominent growing problem and it's growing at an incredibly fast rate, at which politicians, I don't think, are responding at an adequate pace. Uh, so until that's addressed, I think it's it's kind of difficult to ensure that it's everything's conducted fairly, if if you understand what I'm saying. Um, even after the Brexit referendum, we've seen how toothless the Electoral Commission in the UK is. It, it, like, I mean, yeah, they'll slap you with a fine, but if you're a millionaire, what does a fine matter? Um, and that's a culture that you just don't want to see <laughs> uh, going anywhere. So I, I think that we would have to figure out a way to combat this information, whether that's through an independent commissioner specifically set up uh, to monitor these things. Um, but I would say that's the main thing that would have to be addressed. In terms of after a vote, how you bring people together, I suppose, and I'm answering this from a, a, a politician point of view as opposed to a, a government point of view, but as a politician, the first thing I would do is take the key people that were in the opposite campaign and get them at the centre of a committee or a council or whatever that would oversee the, the transition, because that, I think that's the only way that you can, in good faith, bring people with you um, is by showing them. And ultimately, I think, just to say finally, 
The other thing is that in terms of the political parties in Scotland and the narratives that they have, not not the Scottish Conservatives, but the Scottish Lib Dems, Scottish Labour, the the difference in messaging isn't that far apart. You know, in terms of the broad direction of a country, I think we share pretty similar goals. Yeah, we disagree about how to get there, but mm. in terms of that, I think there's a lot of potential for building bridges after a, a you know an, another referendum. Two related questions here, Mary. Uh, one from Ivana, and um, she's she said, uh, you know, I lived in Scotland over ten years ago, and she thought that that Scotland should be independent, but she was actually surprised by the amount of people she encountered who either didn't want it at all or were very nervous about it. And um, what do you think can be done to bring those people on side? That's one question. A related question comes from uh, Jeremy Harrison, who's watching in as well, and he again says, you know, despite successive victories for the SNP. Um, you know, the polls haven't really moved that much in terms of favouring independence. So what can be done to convince those people who are yet to be convinced? And how soon? You know, every, the question everyone's asking is about the timeline, but how soon? So, so two related questions there, just on convincing people who are still a bit unsure, a bit nervous, and, mm -hmm. and what do you think of the timeline? Well, I, I, it doesn't surprise me because I, I remember campaigning and I talk to people all the time that, a lot of people are really ambivalent about independence, in particular in 2014, when the, the kind of turmoil that we've seen over the last five years in particular seemed unimaginable to some people. Um, the, it kind of, it just wasn't worth the risk, you know, and it was all, it was very on the surface issues. And I found with a lot of people that they were actually quite, not that they would admit it, but they were quite frightened to actually engage in any shape or form because it was just like, no, I'm not going there. It's just, nope, I'm happy with what we get. It's but the number of times I heard the phrase, better the devil you know, it just rubbish that, you know, means nothing in politics, but there you go. Um, so that, that doesn't surprise me. And I think that you're right, the, the polls haven't changed all that much. Um, but I think it is noticeable though that the polls have went to a point where the results now not obvious you know it, like in 2014 certainly uh, had you told me at the start of the campaign that we were going to get 45 percent I would have laughed that that seemed impossible you know and it shocked everybody so we have built a, a foundation that, that we can continue to build on and I'm not as concerned about the, the polls not growing in any great numbers because a lot has been going on. And even just talking to people, it doesn't make it right, but a lot of people are just knackered with politics right now. They just can't be bothered engaging with it. Um, so the thought of another referendum and another campaign, they're not exactly jumping in the air about the idea. But on the other hand, because the process in 2014, I think, was so informative, and it actually was a really positive campaign, it, it was in every sense the opposite of the Brexit campaign that came after. But because of that, we actually had a really politically educated electorate, which is great, but it's terrifying for those in power, so to speak. Um, and that's what I think we have to keep building on in order to point out to people that the vast majority of folk who support independence, much to, you know, although folk will tell you to the contrary, it's got nothing to do with flags, it's got nothing to do with patriotism or nationalism. It has purely to do with democracy. It's to do with wanting a better society and, frankly, getting the government you vote for, being able to hold people to account. Um, and throughout the last couple of years, and I think in particular over the next couple of years, people are going to start feeling the reality of what it means to have this Conservative government in power. And particularly when middle class people start to feel it, that's when you're going to see a real change in polls and you're going to see a real change in appetite. Um, but we're nearly there, definitely. 
interesting point about people just being knackered of politics. I think it's, yeah, I think people do just want a bit of calm for a little bit, maybe. Um, question here from, from a colleague of mine, Clauda, who works with me at the OEA. And you've touched on this a little bit around sort of the, the democratic, uh, you know, positives of the EU. But how has the Brexit negotiation process shaped the Scottish outlook on, you know, becoming a member of the EU? Um, you know, in the eyes of Scots, is, is, is the awareness of the EU now heightened? Or are you sort of afraid of getting in the middle of the ongoing UK, Brussels issues? Or, or what, what's, what's your sort of outlook from, from a Scottish perspective towards the EU? Honestly, I think that it's been a positive uh, view of the EU that Scotland has had. And I think it has increased awareness of the EU and the amount that it, you know, that it benefits Scotland being part of, of the Union. Um, but more so, I think that it serves as a, a great comparison. Like I, I made the comparison earlier on, look at how the EU have conducted on behalf of Ireland, frankly, for most of the, the negotiations. And look what, how Westminster represents Scotland. Every single turn, everything was shut down. It, you know, I remember we came out with a paper in 2016 because our approach is if the UK government aren't going to do the work, we'll do the work for them and then give it to them. So we did that. 2016, here's how we can actually have a Brexit where Scotland isn't too badly affected. We can just about live with this. And within hours, it was, nope, not doing it, not at all. And yet Northern Ireland, you know, fast forward 18 months, and yet Northern Ireland gets pretty much exactly what we asked for. It's just, you know, it speaks for itself. And if you thought that, Oh, in fact, no, over this process, I would say more so that it's actually been educational for the EU as well, understanding Scotland's point of view, because in 2014, to put it bluntly, the EU weren't friends of the Yes campaign. They did not make life easy for us. You know, it was all the quotes that politicians made were to benefit David Cameron and the Better Together campaign. And I understand that why that was their point of view. But in dealing with the UK and in seeing how Scotland acts compared to England in particular, I think a lot of, in fact, I know from speaking with them that a lot of the EU officials are now starting to get it and they're realising, oh, right, there is, Scotland actually would be far better. And there is also a difference in, I suppose, appetite to be part of the EU. Um, and through those conversations, I have no doubt that Scotland would be welcomed with open arms uh, into the EU as an independent country. Um, uh, and I think there's been plenty of examples of where if the, the political will is there, the EU will do anything. Um, so essentially, it's what we argue for. Very good. Uh, two two related questions again. The, the the questions are coming in very in sync, so that's that's good. Keep it up. Um, one question from Stephen, and he asked specifically about sort of you know your vision for an independent Scotland and, and its relations with Ireland, um, and and you know he references a recent Ireland Scotland joint bilateral review which was carried out from the Scottish government, and and what's your vision for that? relationship and then an interesting question which I haven't really thought of myself but it's come in from Owen Flaherty he said very interesting discussion thanks for, for your contribution so far Mary and he says what is the relationship like between the SNP and unionism in Northern Ireland <laughs> and does does it exist and what is the relationship like okay. and uh, how would the Scottish independence movements obviously affect unionism in Northern Ireland so um, two two different questions but both regarding Scotland's relations okay. on this island um, so, the, to answer the first question, my vision of what an independent Scotland is, essentially I, I want to see a socialist republic, um, and I find that when you're talking to people, the word socialist in particular can get their backs immediately up and go, nope, radical, but when you actually describe what it is you're wanting, I want the natural resources to be used for the benefit of the people that live there, I want fair taxation, I want people to have health care and you start listing things, 
suddenly, oh, that sounds great. Yeah, I, I, I want that Scotland too. <laughs> um, so no matter what you call it, uh, that's the Scotland I want to see is one where there's basically a bit of compassion to it. It recognises humanity, I suppose. Um, so that would be what I, I, I would hope for. And in terms of how what our relationship to Ireland would be, I think, frankly, I mean, we look to Ireland in admiration and to kind of lead examples, not just of what to do, but sometimes also what not to do or how to go about things differently. But Ireland has proven that constituent parts of the UK are not dependent on Westminster and actually they thrive better when the decisions are made by the people who live there. Uh, so I, I see nothing but I would hope a blossoming <laughs> a friendship there if Scotland was to become independent. Now, in terms of the SNP and unionism, the reason I laugh is because what unionism in Northern Ireland means is, I suppose I call it diet unionism in Scotland. Um, because where Ireland as a whole, both Northern Ireland and the Republic, have, of course, a very complicated history, a very intrinsic history that it's, <laughs> you don't need British politicians commenting on or giving their opinions on. But in Scotland, particularly, and uh, this is just more the west coast of Scotland, it's, it's about football, it's about Celtic and Rangers, it's you know, it's under the guise of religious bigotry or relig religious differences, but it's about football. And that, to me, makes it all the more pathetic in, in Scotland. So the SNP, I suppose, has a, a difficult relationship and that is a fine line to walk. And I'm quite happy dismissing people who live their lives dictated by a football team. But when it steps into the, I suppose, the more deep-seated uh, sectarianism and uh, I suppose the more hardcore unionism that you see uh, in Northern Ireland in particular, I think it's a different kettle of fish. It's, you know, it's all from the same tree, but it's that requires more attention and more understanding. And that is built on what is perceived cultural differences. So let's talk about them. Let's try and figure out how we can move forward together. Um, so in, in, in that sense, the SNP has a cautious relationship and that we don't want to offend anybody needlessly, but equally, let's talk about some stuff, because especially if you're angry, which a lot of unionists seem to be. Okay, look, we'll, we'll jump off topic slightly. There's loads of questions in on, on yeah. Scotland and Scotland's future, but just as a different question, just to give us a bit of break from that, uh, there's a question here from Hannah. Hannah DC, and she says, great to hear from you, Mary. Wondering if Mary has any thoughts or reflections on what it's like to be a young MP and how parliamentary politics can be reformed so it's more uh, accessible and inclusive, both mm -hmm. in terms of elections and also parliamentary day-to-day -day business and, uh, and more inclusive young people. So just your thoughts on yeah. that, and then we go back to the Scottish stuff. Cool. Um, well, I think, God, reflecting on my experience <laughs> has been a bit mad and... Now it's much better, not just because I'm older, but because there has been a great increase in the number of under 30s elected in the last few parliaments. Um, so in that sense, it's a baby step in the right direction, I, I suppose. But Westminster in particular, inclusive isn't a word I would use to describe it at all. Um, I remember, I mean, even just in the most basic sense, I remember uh, in 2015, uh, my gran was coming down to visit and she had to come in in a wheelchair and navigating that building in a wheelchair is scandalous. <laughs> Honestly, it's unbelievable. Um, and because of that and because of the nature of the job and the traditions of the job, which is pretty much what, what dictates most things, which is weird. Um, it, it's just, I think it is a very difficult place for young people to kind of find their feet in or want to get involved in to start off with, but particularly young women. 
uh, and women in general, I, you know, I, I look to a lot of my older colleagues and I just think, how are you able to do this when they're sitting in the corridors FaceTiming their three-year-old child and it's just, you know, it's half 11 at night and the only reason that we're there is because some Tory has decided to force a vote even though we're going to lose it. <laughs> you know, it's it's just a really bizarre way of working. Um, and quite frankly, if Parliament and how it functions was a private business, it would be shut down in a heartbeat. It'd be out of business in a week. I mean, there's literal mice running about the building. It's falling apart. The bits are cordoned off because concrete will just fall as you're walking past. It's really bizarre, but it, it is reinforces this real arrogant superiority to the rest of the world you know because in it I, i'm talking about it like it's a thing right but in westminster's minds it's still the british empire you know it's still all that pompousness all that arrogance it's really it lets itself down and there have been moves in the right direction but not nearly enough. And for example, as I was saying to you before we started this, the hybrid parliament has been phenomenal and it would open up opportunity for a lot of people um, and increase accessibility for a lot of people into parliament. And you can do the job just as well. In fact, some ways I would argue we're able to do it better because not so much time is taken up faffing about. Um, but they're pulling that in September, it's going to go back to the queues and the bobbing and all the rest of it. So I don't hold out much hope, but I'd be lying if I said it wasn't difficult being young in politics. Um, was that the only thing you asked? Yes, it was a specific question on sort of inclusivity and, and yeah. So, I mean, in terms of sort of um, changing things i mean how, how how could you how could you make it more inclusive how could you attract and, and try and encourage young people to get involved because obviously people like yourself mm -hmm. give voice to so many young people who just feel it's not for them and that's that's mm -hmm. not my game it's a stuffy old person's game so is there any 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 insights or thoughts you know having been there now for coming on six years i, th I think the the first thing is political parties have a responsibility to make sure that People can be can people can afford to be candidates, and if you can't afford to be a candidate off your own back, then support should be in place for you to do it. Because um, and I know that some parties have introduced that, and the SNP introduced that a couple of years ago. But it, you know, like all things, it could be much more effective and robust. But I suppose that's a good starting point, um, certainly, so that you're getting because politics attracts the absolute worst and a slither of the best you know and that's kind of you don't really want that scenario <laughs> so it's trying to figure out how can you change that and I think making parliament much more accessible being able to I suppose make it much more flexible as well and bring it into the 21st century frankly it would be a major step and getting folk putting themselves forward because right now you've got way too much to lose you know unless you're a 20 year old that doesn't know better <laughs> pretty good i suppose look going back to the the, the, the possibility of, of independence and um, there's two questions on borders sure. um you know very topical obviously to the irish case and um, given the issues surrounding the northern Ireland protocol um, you know what do you think that the scottish english border would look like that's one question that comes from Mark. The second question comes in from Killian Malloy. You know, the difficulty of the of the UK removing itself from a larger trading block of the EU has been exposed. And now you're looking to remove yourself from that block. And, um, you know, how do you see the challenges emerging there uh, from a trade point of view, from an from economic development point of view? And uh, so, yeah, two questions on borders, which I think were inevitable, given the subject matter. Excellent. Right. So... To answer the first question on the border, the honest answer is I have no idea what the border would look like if Scotland voted for independence, but that's not for want of trying. And in terms of the SNP and the Yes campaign more broadly, 
we have all made explicitly clear that we have no desire whatsoever to implement a hard border. Why would we? It is in nobody's interest. And the EU shows that it is not necessary <laughs> if you can manage it properly. Um, so the obstacles would not be coming from us. The same can't be said for who we would be negotiating with, as the EU will tell you. Um, so in that case, that's why I'm saying I don't know what it would look like, because it would totally depend on how the UK negotiates, what they negotiate. But uh, for all the reassurance that we could give, there is no desire from pro-yes political parties to have anything close to that. Because a lot of what the yes campaign and the vision of independence is based upon is trying to bring Scotland into the world. Um, rather than being dependent on London to conduct business internationally on our behalf, being able to do it ourselves and actually being neighbours, equal neighbours, uh, as opposed to what we've had to endure uh, you know, for the, the last couple of years. Um, and in terms of the second question, which was, uh, I can't, read my own notes there. It was broadly related, it was similar, it was very similar on the border issue, but I suppose it was just about separating yourself from the trading block, what you know, you've had like, such yes. deep relations with, with, with the UK, and how would that look? Thank you. Well, that, I think, is dependent a lot on what I've talked about and the, the kind of Scotland we want to build, and if Scotland votes for independence in the near future, say the next five years, I truly believe that there would be no desire to see Scotland move in a different direction as to what I've just described, um, certainly not to set it up. But this is where I suppose I think that the arguments for independence become stronger, not just from what I said earlier on in terms of the EU being a better union than the UK, quite frankly, but it's also in terms of how Scotland is managed. And it frustrates me to no end. Every year, the JERS figures come out, uh, and uh, are you aware of what the JERS figures are? It's just, it's basically, it's an economic snapshot of the UK and how we're doing, basically. So these JERS figures are brought out every year, and they point to Scotland, where Scotland has terrible numbers and has a giant deficit, and they say, look, you wouldn't be able to be independent. The irony of that is that document is telling us how Scotland is managed by Westminster. We don't make the economic policy, they guys do. So to me, it's so ironic when they wheel these figures out as though it's something to you know, boast with pride about when in actual fact, all it proves is that Scotland is mismanaged. And to give you a couple of concrete examples, uh, which ties into the, the EU, part. Recently I, I was up in Orkney with uh, one of the commi parliament committees and one of the experts there was telling us that Denmark and the UK were pretty similar in terms of resource potential and ability in, in terms of uh, investing in wind power and this was in the 1980s so of course new technology. Now the UK, of course, Thatcher, very, you know, deregulated pro-capitalist, she decided, and her government decided, no, we're not going to invest in wind. We just want to get it operating at the cheapest we possibly can, which of course meant that, yes, folk were buying up lots, but it, we weren't harnessing the resource that we had. Whereas Denmark, which is a tenth of the size of the UK, did invest. And as a result of that, I think it was in 20, 2019 or something, the wind power was worth, I think it was like seven point something billion euros for Denmark, which is the equivalent of what the arms trade is worth in the UK industry. Can you imagine if we had actually invested properly in renewables instead of in the arms industry, how much more we'd have to offer? So that's had a knock-on effect in Scotland, where we are pride place to 
invest in renewables, but it's not happening. Similarly, in, uh, when Norway discovered oil the same time that Scotland discovered oil, and yet they used it uh, responsibly, setting up the oil fund, Thatcher used our oil money just to fill a black hole of debt, just to keep the books looking good. And as a result of that, we now have some of the worst poverty right beside the exact spot of where the resource that is worth a fortune was found. So I think that as we move forward, particularly with tidal energy, with media, with uh, tourism, Scotland can't afford to let these resources go to waste for another generation. And us wanting to invest properly in all of these areas not only will benefit massively Scotland, but that will benefit the rest of the world and it will benefit our international image with the rest of the world and how we relate to the rest of the world. So when you keep in mind that the UK is, what, seven times smaller than the size of the EU single market, if Scotland lives up to its potential and is able to make decisions in its own interests, then I see no reason or argument as to why Westminster would not want to kind of get a bite of the apple, so to speak. So I, I don't have concerns there. I think Scotland has a positive international future ahead of it if it goes independent. Okay, question here, and we will wrap up in a couple of minutes as well. So if you have any final questions, please do submit them. Um, question from Alex, and he says, thanks very much for your presentation. Alex Fife, and he says, uh, thanks very much for coming along and speaking to us this evening. And he, he says, you know, if, if you meet someone who sort of, you know, digs their heels in and says, absolutely no way to independence, you know, what is the most persuasive argument you have up your sleeve? I think you've just given us a bit of a sample of that in terms yeah. of Scotland being in charge of its own destiny. And the other question that I wanted to ask as well, uh, it comes from Vera, and it's back to the timeline issue. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, is the success potentially of India F2 reliant on what might happen in Northern Ireland in terms of possibly getting... The, the, the Westminster government to buckle and give in for mm -hmm. that to happen. So sort of a, a race of referendums there. So two different questions, but interested to get your views on both of them. What's your most persuasive argument? And and are you in a sort of race with Northern Ireland to see if they get, uh, if it was the United Ireland force, and then you might follow? So I think the, the most persuasive argument, um, it would actually probably be the one that I made earlier, but doing it properly and saying, look, what are the positives? What would be the arguments for joining the UK? Your government will move 400 miles away. You actually won't get governments you vote for. You will routinely have to fork out billions for nuclear weapons, which we know you don't want, but uh, your neighbour will decide what you can spend your money on and how much you can spend it on. They'll also decide what areas they'll let you make your own mind up. It's just nuts. Um, similarly, you know, one of the simplest ways to convey it to people is to say, look, imagine a house. Would you let your neighbour run your house, dictate how much of your wages you got? You wouldn't. And if you did have that set up and you brought it to an end, there's no reason why... <laughs> you know, you wouldn't still live beside each other. Um, so I, I suppose it is as simple as that. Um, the once, I suppose when you talk to different people, it's about trying to find out what their niggle is, what is it that they're worried about, you know, because for some people it's something as simple as their pension, their free bus pass. They want to make sure that they're going to still have their house if we vote for independence, simple stuff. Um, but as a broad all argument I would say the one that I've made um, in terms of Scotland being in a race with Northern Ireland I mean I suppose depending on what your viewpoint is <laughs> I don't know if we're going to the same finish line <laughs> um, but yes I, I do I think that Scotland it's not racing Northern Ireland it's rather watching with great interest because half of the reason why the UK government have are in such a difficult position that they've put themselves in is because with one side of their face, they are saying to Scotland, no, 
you can't be independent and have a soft border. It, it can't happen. So no, you, it's going to be a hard border. You're not going to be able to see your English family unless you travel with a passport. And, you know, that immediately throws people off. But then with the other side of their face, they're going into negotiations in Brussels and going, yeah, it won't be a problem. Of course, come on. And at some point, those two negotiators talk to each other and realise, oh, you didn't promise them that, did you? Oh, I, d I thought, right, OK. So th they know they're in this position, and that's why you see such bizarre spin coming from them, because if they can do anything to portray it other than the downright hypocrisy that it is, um, it's, it's just, yeah. So, no, I, I think we watch Northern Ireland to keep an eye on what's happening. But also, I do think there's an element of solidarity there, though, in that uh, certainly those who were alive before the, the peace process, I think there is a genuine solidarity in that it can never go back to that. And God help the person who does put it back to that, because we're coming after you kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, not a race, but watching with interest. Definitely. Brilliant. Look, uh, Mario, coming towards the end, one final question for me, and we'll finish up then. Um, let's assume you know you're still in politics, and and we, we have a a, a a an independent Scotland. Um, assuming you're you're in you're in the cabinet, you're a minister in an independent Scotland. What would you like to be minister of, and and what would what would be a first the first item on your list to to fix? <laughs> uh, I've always wanted to be uh, the minister of general mayhem. And mischief yeah, that would be a cool title i suppose that i would actually like to be in charge of finance i would love to be a chancellor for a day and just have a clear out just a total change of system here's how we're going to function from this date <laughs> that's it uh, i made that sound a bit Dictatory. A little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Got to very be good. Okay, brilliant. Look, Mary, thanks so much for your time. Oh, you know, you only you gave us you gave us five minutes of an opening and then we've just had questions, questions, questions. We've been all over the place with different questions. So really, really appreciate the time you've given us this evening in a heat wave in July. Um, <laughs> so thanks very much. And look, hopefully when we're when we're back up and running in the IEA in person, uh, we might be able to get you over for, for a talk in person, get oh, you to visit really? Dublin. Oh, and God. um Thanks again and, and enjoy your summer break. Excellent. No, thank you for having me and thank you to everybody for listening to me drone on. <laughs> thank you. Cheers. Good luck. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.